Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship on this Christ the King Sunday. I would, a reminder to sign the friendship pad and pass that down the pew so we can uh, be aware of who's worshiping with us and greet them uh, following the worship service. Also, a time of uh, fellowship in the Friendship Center after the service is complete. Uh, a couple of announcements to call your attention to uh, in, the, in the yellow insert. The Salvation Army bell ringing. We are the only church in Grinnell that does this, and the Salvation Army is greatly appreciative of the work that we've done. So there's a clipboard by the large screen TV. If you can sign up, we are responsible for December 20th at Fairway from 9 to 2. So anytime during that day, if you want to only do a half an hour slot or an hour slot, whatever, faith friends, confirmands can do it together, families can do it. However, um, they're just grateful that we are uh, able to do that. Um, also, the, uh, on December 7th, the Stephen Ministers are going to have a refresher course on listening. So this is not only for uh, Stephen Ministers, but for other people who would like to be part of the caring ministry of the church, uh, congregational care. Uh, you can uh, let Barb Norman know if you've got any questions. Uh, you can talk to Barb Norman or myself, or you can just show up uh, for that. Um, Christmas Shares is in the uh, Friendship Center as well. Sign up for the, or the little envelopes that you can pick up for that. Uh, there's a table in there for that. And Ashley has an announcement. The Senior High wrapping paper is in if you've ordered. I have some samples here. And if you forgot to order, didn't get to order, didn't realize that we were there, you have some samples to look at before you can order your own because we have some late orders that you can get in um, today. And then I will send them in tomorrow. It takes about two weeks to get. So you can check out what's there already and see if you like it. Also out on that table along with Christmas share are some pumpkins and decorations for your Thanksgiving table if you haven't gotten that far yet. And uh, we also have some leftover cards for Christmas cards, if you would like to take a look at those or purchase those. Thanks. Any other announcements? Uh, the purple insert, um, medical supplies drive, this is something that the Grinnell College students put together, and there will be a box um, out here in the entryway for you to bring those things. Uh, by the 15th of December, they need to have those um, to take with them. Um, let's stand and greet one another now in the name of Christ. Good morning. I hope you're looking forward with anticipation to Thanksgiving Day coming this Thursday. Godspeed for those who are traveling, and we hope that people coming in arrive safely as well. Our service today helps us get in that frame of mind of Thanksgiving, because in a few moments we're going to be singing, Come Ye Thankful People Come. The Carillon Choir is going to be ringing, We Gather Together. And indeed, we do have much to be thankful for. The lectionary scripture for this week includes Psalm 100, which also gives us an insight on thanksgiving. Because it's a short psalm, I'm going to read the whole thing in the King James Poetic Version. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth unto all generations. This psalm does represent a song of thanksgiving 
but it's not directly related to a bountiful harvest or the defeat of some particular enemy. Instead, uh, we're thankful that we're God's people, part of his family. And our understanding of that relationship should be more complete than the psalmist because we have the advantage that Jesus showed us the depth and the breadth of what God intended. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Dear God, on this Sunday, which the church calendar calls Christ the King Sunday, we celebrate Jesus' reign. Help us to live up to the responsibilities and possibilities of being your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. For the Lord is a great God. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Come, Ye Thankful People, Come. That's number 694 in the hymnal. May be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of majesty, you love us with an everlasting love and show us the way to justice and peace. In Jesus Christ, you have reconciled the whole world to you and claimed us as your own, that we may live as his body on earth and with all the saints enter into your glory on the last day. Amen. 
Today's New Testament lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, found on page 181 of the Pew Bible. In it, we hear Paul tell the Christians in Ephesus of the glorious inheritance of all believers. He reminds them and us that the same power that raised Christ from death and placed him above every imaginable power is at work on our behalf. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We now invite the children to come forward for time with the young church with Linda Risting. Hello, how are y'all doing? Good. I have some things laid out here. I just want you to look at them. We're going to talk about them here in just a little bit. Now, sitting up here, if I were to say, I am really, really thirsty. I haven't had anything to drink for a really long time. What could perhaps you do? Yes, sir. I, you could give me a drink of this water, couldn't you? Yeah. Okay. Let's say I haven't had anything to eat for a really long time and I'm really, really hungry. What could we do with the things that are up here? Yes, sir. I could eat the Twix candy bar. Sounds like a plan to me. And then finally, the last thing I have up here, if I were to say, you know, I have this cut and it was bleeding and it really hurts and I don't know what to do because it, it's really bothering me. Anybody have an idea? What could I do? I could put the Band-Aid on it, and I'll bet you that if any of you saw me out on the street and I said that to you, you might try to help me find some of these things, wouldn't you? And might say, yeah, here, I can help you find a drink. And you know, whenever you do something for me, or if it's even better, if you do it for somebody you don't know, you see somebody and they have a need and you can help them, that is really, <coughs> really cool. And you're going to hear in the Bible verse that Pastor Rose is going to read, that if you do these things, like if you help me out and would give me a drink or give me a Band-Aid, it's just like you're doing it for Jesus. And that is really cool. But we also have to remember that if we see something that somebody needs and we don't do it, that's like we're not doing it for Jesus too. So that's just as bad as it is good to do stuff. So I guess what I'm saying is we have to look at people and sometimes figure out what they might need and say, what could I do to help? And then I'm like helping Jesus as well as helping that person, and that is really cool. So I have some things in my bag that I want you to take home with you. I have some Band-Aids, and I want you to remember when you need a Band-Aid that maybe somebody else might need one, and you need to keep an eye out for somebody that you could help do something like that. And I have some little Twixes and some um, other little candies in here. I'd like you to take two or three, just take several, and maybe out there you'll see somebody who might be going, man, my stomach is growling. And maybe it could be somebody you don't know, too, you know. And you could give those out to a few people on your way back. 
So before we get those things, let's, if you would repeat after me for the prayer, let's bow in a prayer. Dear God, please help me look at people so I might see the things they need and then go do those things even if I may not know them. Amen. Thank you. So I have some Band-Aids, and you pick out one to take, so next time you need one, you'll remember that. And then I have some goodies. I'm never above bribery to get you all to come up and listen. Take two or three and then hand them out as you go back. I'll pass them over to the other side here, too. Oh, yep, those band-aids are right down there. We've got Ninja Turtle band-aids and Minion band-aids. All right. Oop, you didn't get any of that. Everybody else, did you get some? Very good. Thank you. The Carillon Bell Choir will now share the gift of music we gather together.
Thank you, Caroline Choir. Our gospel reading this morning is the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, and in this particular section, Jesus shares that image of what's called the great judgment. Hear this word of God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we thank you for your word. Your word that comforts us and yet challenges us at the same time. And we pray, O oh God, on this Thanksgiving Sunday and this week of Thanksgiving as we are mindful of the many blessings that we have been given, that we also remember those who are the least of these among us. We pray that this text would challenge us to open our eyes, to see the need around us, as if we are seeing you. So pour out your spirit upon us as we hear your word proclaimed. O oh God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we could call this sermon, same song, third verse. We've been in Matthew 25 for three weeks now. You may remember that the first time we, we talked about uh, the foolish and the wise bridesmaids. Jesus is just trying to get us to understand what it is that he has as this vision of the kingdom of God and how we live our lives accordingly. So he shares that image of the bridesmaids. He also has an image of the servant, the, the master and the servants. The servants receive all of these talents, uh, this, this money from the master. And then he discovers when he comes back how they have cared for those resources that he has given them. And now today we have this final section. And in this section, Jesus is really trying to hit his point home. It's a really um, vivid portrayal of what this kingdom of God will look like. He has a very clear, radical message of what it is to live as part of the kingdom of God. And when I read this particular passage, I think of a couple of things. One is a situation that happened when I was at the, serving the church in, in Vinton, which was not very far from Cedar Rapids. People that went to the hospital usually went to Cedar Rapids. That was where the district office was, so we had a lot of meetings in Cedar Rapids. And so quite often I would 
would be driving around Cedar Rapids. And, and oftentimes, on this one particular busy thoroughfare, there was a guy standing on the corner. Now, this guy looked a little rough around the edges. He had kind of worn-looking clothing on. His hair was rather unkempt. It was kind of shoved up underneath of a, a dirty old stocking cap. And he had a, a sign made out of cardboard. And on the sign, it said, have cancer, out of work, need help. Well, I would see this guy quite often, and I would just kind of stare ahead, not pay attention to him really, and just drive on and, and do my appointed tasks. But it got to me every time I saw him because I knew this text, and this was a person in need, and I was ignoring him. And I really felt pretty bad about that. So I, th I thought, you know, I kept telling myself, next time I come to town and I see this guy, I'm going to give him some money. And this went on for a few, a few times. Well, in the meantime, I read this article in Weavings, which is an upper room publication. And uh, it was written by a clergywoman, and she was on a road trip with her sister. And they're driving down the interstate, and they, they pull off on the, on the exit ramp and get to the stop sign, and there's a guy with raggy-looking clothes and a sign that he needed help. So she rolls the window down, and she gives this man whatever money it was that she had in her purse, and her sister looked at her and said, what, are you crazy? How do you know what he's going to do with that money? He's probably just going to go buy drugs or cigarettes or alcohol. Don't waste your money. And she turned around and looked at her sister and said, but this is what the Lord commands me to do, is to reach out to those who are in need. What he does with that gift is his choice. I can't control that. So the next time I drove to Cedar Rapids, there was the guy, and I rolled the window down, and I gave him what money I had in my purse. This happened several times, because he was there for quite some time. Now you probably think, oh, what a pushover you are. But I kept hearing that verse. Lord, when did you see me? Lord, when did you see me? Hungry, thirsty, in need of a home, any of those kind of things. And so I responded out of what I felt I was called to do. What that guy did with that, I have no idea. But that was his choice, what he did with that. I did what I was called to do. And we just pray that he did what he was called to do. And, you know, we don't know what happens to any of those gifts that we ever give. You know, it could be a Christmas present. Somebody could turn around and re-gift it to somebody else the next year. We don't know. As soon as it leaves our hands, it's, does, it's not ours anymore. What that other person does is out of our control. But we can say in our heart of hearts, Lord, when we saw you hungry, this is how I fed you. When you were thirsty, this is how I gave you something to drink. When we saw you hurting because of the injustice in the world, this is what we have done to alleviate some of your suffering. So on this Christ the King Sunday, this particular passage from Matthew's Gospel reminds us of the importance of living our lives in such a way that we honor and that we recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord and King in our life. On this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we realize how many blessings we have received. We are called to offer our lives back to God in gratitude as we respond to those times when we see the Lord hungry, thirsty, sick, and all the rest. Lord, when did we see you? If we have the eyes and hearts, we see. Jesus provides this powerful and somewhat haunting passage at the end of his public ministry. So when you think of Jesus, what image comes to mind? If you had to describe Jesus to somebody, what image would you use? Some of you might say he's a friend. Some might say he's a gentle shepherd. Somebody who calms the storms in the midst of my life. Royal king. Judge. Those are a couple of images we don't often think of. But in this passage, it's referred to as the last judgment or the judgment of all nations because ultimately we are accountable for those things we do in this life here on earth. The Son of Man. Matthew wants us to understand Jesus' humanity. 
the Son of Man will come in glory surrounded by angels sitting on a throne. Matthew also wants us to remember the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us of this in the lectionary reading from the first chapter of Ephesians when he says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body. Jesus is the one who separates the people, the sheep, from the goats, or to use other images that Matthew uses, the grain from the chaff, the wheat from the weeds, the wise from the foolish. As king and judge, Jesus is on the throne looking at the actions of the people and the nations and divides them as a shepherd would divide the sheep from the goats because in those days the sheep were of more value. And to those who saw the needs of the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned, the king welcomed them into the eternal life of their kingdom. To those who do not, they were sent into eternal punishment. And here we have yet a third story in this gospel of Matthew in chapter 25. That's a hard story to hear. But yet it's a call for us to examine what we do and how we use the resources that we've been given. And there Jesus does, and he goes and does it again. Three times in this passage he's been talking about how we use the resources that we've been given. Because it takes our time, it takes our energy, it takes our financial resources to reach out in concern and love to those who are the least of these among us. But if we are so caught up in thinking only about ourselves, we miss those blessings that God has for us as we share out of what we have been given. The rather interesting thing about this passage is that it never mentions our faith per se or our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not that those things are not important, but the story is a reminder that that personal connection we have with Christ is not a be-all, end-all. It's not, it's not the biggest deal out there. It's not the end of the story. It's a wake-up call to do those things that we are called to do in the world around us. And are our actions consistent with who we say that we are? Not in a works righteousness sort of way, but in a way that our faith in Christ is lived out of that relationship that we have with Christ in the world around us. Is our witness congruent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need both of those things. And that is what endears me to the United Methodist Church and John Wesley's understanding that we have to have both this inner relationship with Jesus Christ as well as it being fleshed out in the world around us. That inner relationship is nurtured as we come together in worship. It's strengthened as we spend time together in prayer and in study and in conversation with other Christians. But we go beyond that. We cannot leave it there. We go beyond ourselves as we give to others. We go beyond ourselves in our witness and in our service. Wesley was insistent that both parts of, those of our life were important, that we cannot have one without the other. And that's why this story from Matthew moves me every single time I read it. It's not those big, giant things that are the important thing here. It's the simple gestures of compassion, of human kindness, and mercy towards one another and for all of creation. They are simple acts of making sure that your neighbor child has something to eat. They are the simple act of visiting that lonely person down the street whose spouse may have just passed away. It's the simple thing of working to make sure that all people are seen as valuable members of our communities. And it's easy for us to say that I'm too busy to do that. We get too self-absorbed, we ignore the needs of those people around us, and we just simply pass them by. Which leads me to another story that I remember every time I read this passage. Way back when the United Methodist Church still had Clear Lake as one of our church camps, and I was a seminary student, so this was back in the mid-80s, two colleagues of mine were directing confirmation camp, and they needed a female staff person, so I was volunteered. 
Well, we took the kids through the entire church year from Advent to Pentecost. Every day was a different season of the church year. And we, we come to the point in the church year where we read this story of the great judgment. We were also talking about the needs of, of the world around us, and so we were talking about world hunger and how other, most of the world lives. So for breakfast, everybody got a juice box and a half a tortilla. There were no snacks. Lunchtime came along, we got another box of juice and the other half of the tortilla. No snacks until dinner time. We gather outside of the, the auditorium, between the auditorium and the, and the dining hall, and we, we had about 100 kids that year, and uh, we read this story of the great judgment, the sheep and the goats. And then we proceeded to take newspapers, layers and layers of newspapers, and wrap them around the arms of, the, of all the students and duct tape them so that they couldn't bend their elbows. So they're running around with their arms like this. Now these are, these are middle school kids, you have to remember. They haven't had hardly anything to eat all day. We take them into the dining room and the tables are heaped with big giant bowls of spaghetti and meatballs, garlic toast, salad, and dessert. And we said, there's dinner. Well, the looks on their faces, they were shocked, they were frustrated, because it's like, how am I going to eat when my arms are like this? Some of them were just downright angry, like, this is just so unfair. How dare you do this to us? So we sat them all down, filled up their plates, and waited. We waited for the kids to figure out what the secret was for the kingdom of God. And you know what the secret was? As soon as we saw kids pick up the silverware across the table, scoop into the other kid's plate of spaghetti, and feed the other kid, we knew that they had the secret of the kingdom. We whisked them out of the room, took the stuff off of their arms, and put them in a dining room where they could freely eat all the spaghetti they wanted to eat. But the interesting thing in that story was the students who absolutely, absolutely refused to reach across the table to pick up the silverware of somebody that they did not know. They sat there and watched all these other people figure it out, and they would not do it. And the option of sticking their face in a plate of spaghetti and just slurping it up was not available, because we saw them do that. We said, no, that's not, that's not the secret to the kingdom. <laughs> Some of them tried that. But it was a really an interesting commentary on the state of humanity and how we can just so easily ignore the needs of someone else. And that's what this story points to. There's yet another story that comes out of the headlines this week. The news of Dr. Martin Salia, a doctor from West Africa's Sierra Leone who passed away from Ebola. It was on national news, but the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, was in a story by the United Methodist News Service. It comes from the General Board of Global Ministries. Salia was a was the chief medical doctor at this United Methodist Kesey Hospital in Freetown, Sierra Leone. It's a 60-bed hospital that has a larger community outreach that includes a school, an eye clinic, and a newly updated maternal and child health facility. And he went there to give his life to serve others. Lord, when did we see you sick? The bishop from Sierra Leone, Bishop John Yambusa, as well as Bishop Scott Jones, who's the bishop in the Great Plains Conference here in the United States, which includes Kansas and Nebraska. This man was, was treated in, in Omaha. Uh, they all called for a period of mourning in recognition of this great loss. They said that United Methodists are encouraged to be health advocates for all and to respond more quickly to global health issues. Bishop Warner Brown, who's the president of the United Methodist Council of Bishops, said the church is deeply saddened by the news of Celia's passing, calling him a dedicated Christian physician who lived out a calling to serve others. We are inspired by his faith and by other health care workers like him around the world who provide medical care to those who might otherwise not have that care, even at risk to themselves. Dr. Salia had been interviewed earlier this year by United Methodist Communications about why it was important for him to work in a Christian hospital. And he said, I knew it wasn't going to be rosy, but why did I decide to do this job? I firmly believe God wanted me to do it. And I do, knew deep within myself there was just something inside of me 
that the people of this part of Freetown needed help. I see it as God's own desired framework for me. I took this job not because I want to, but I firmly believe that it was a calling and that God wanted me to. And I'm pretty sure, I'm confident, that I just need to lean on him, trust him for whatever comes in, because he sent me here. And that's my passion. Salia said his philosophy was simple. God will heal them, and money comes. I firmly believe God wanted me to do this job. It was my calling. And I think John Buchanan says it well, sums up this whole Matthew 25 in his commentary when he says, Jesus said, God is here in the messiness and the ambiguity of human life, God is here, particularly in your neighbor, the one who needs you. You want to see the face of God? Look into the eyes of the least of these, the vulnerable, the weak, the children. He says that there's no discussion about theology in this particular part of the passage. There's no, no talk about church practice, no talk about creeds, right belief or any of that. He says there's only one criterion here, and that is whether or not you saw Jesus Christ in the face of the needy, and whether or not you gave yourself away in love in his name. Lord, when did we see you? Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 327, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
As we come to God in prayer, we remember our Ministerial Association Ministry of the Week, the St. John's Thanksgiving Community Dinner. And we also thank uh, God for the work of the trustees, for the new doors and the sound system. Uh, there's still some work to be done on the doors uh, and the interior doors, but uh, we thank them for that work that they've, they've been doing. Um, also prayers of uh, sympathy for uh, Monique Shore's family, the death of her grandmother. They've uh, just left to be on their way to Wisconsin to uh, share with family in the celebration of her grandmother's life. Also, uh, at first service this morning, learned that um, Robert Renault's sister Janice passed away this past week, and uh, her services were in Colorado Springs. Are there other joys or concerns that you'd like to share this morning? The joy that Thanksgiving and travel and all of that, travel mercies for people as they're going to visit with family this week, and that it's a good time, and that your favorite football team wins on Thanksgiving Day, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we do thank you for the many gifts that you give to us, gifts that are beyond our wildest comprehension. And we thank you especially for that gift of life that you give to us in Jesus Christ, and that in that life that you call us beyond just the personal relationship that we have with him, that we live that relationship out in the world around us, as we reach out to those who are the least of these, that are members of your family. So give us eyes to see, O oh God. We live in a world of plenty, and we have lots on our tables, but we also remember the poor who struggle for daily bread. We pray, O oh God, for those who lack just the simple, basic necessities of life. And we pray that we would be willing to share the resources that you have given to us. And we pray for forgiveness when we hoard those resources, whether it's out of our anxiety, our ignorance, or our selfishness. We pray that you would open our eyes to the presence of the poor around us and free us for joyful giving so that they may have those basic necessities. Loving God, you invite us to offer hospitality to the stranger in our midst and to welcome the weary. We pray for those who emigrate to new lands, to refugees of political and religious war, for those who have no place to call home. We pray that you would bless those who offer refuge to the stranger. And we pray, O oh God, that you would be with the leaders of our country as they seek to find ways to provide for those who are the least among us. We pray for those who minister to the stranger among us and to those who would refuse them. Help us to find your compassion and live that compassion in the world around us. Loving and gracious God, you call us to listen to the cry of all of those who are in distress. For you hear those cries. And we pray that you would heal those who are sick, whether it is in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up those needs that have been shared this morning and those needs that are within our heart. Teach us, O oh God, to serve our brothers and our sisters and to share in their burdens. Loving God, Jesus himself was a prisoner of Rome before his execution. And he instructed his disciples to visit those in prison so we pray for those who are incarcerated, for those who work in prisons, and for those who minister to them. Help us, O oh God, to have the eyes to see and the hearts to act. We thank you for this season of thanksgiving. And in that season and in that spirit of gratitude and joyfulness, help us to share that same gratitude with those around us. We pray now, O oh God, that you would hear us as we each offer our own prayers in the silence of these moments, be they prayers of thanksgiving or prayers of confession or prayers of intercession, hear our prayers, O oh God.
Almighty and loving God, we are thankful that we can come to your throne of grace and offer those prayers that come from deep within us, prayers that we sometimes cannot even verbalize, but you know. And so thank you for hearing our prayers. And we place our trust in you, that in your will and in your time, you hear and answer. We pray now that you would hear us as we join together in that prayer that Christ the King has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Judy Cook to come forward for a United Methodist Women recognition. Each year we uh, honor a person for their uh, service to uh, UMW and to the church or just to the church. And so this morning I, uh, in the early service, did honored uh, Laura Klein, and now I'm going to do Linda Christy. Would you please come forward? <laughs> Linda has been a co-chairman of one of the circles um, for several years. Uh, she is in the bell choir, she teaches Sunday school, and you see her working around the church quite often in other capacities. So I, with great pleasure, present her with a UMW pen and a certificate and a rose. Thank you very much. And we were and we gain money to missions for, on your name. That's awesome, thank you very much. <laughs> and now we share out of those gifts that God has given to us as we joyfully bring forward our tithes and our offerings as the ushers come forward.
Let us pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept our offering in union with Christ's offering for us. Confirm in us the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, that we may testify to the sovereignty of his love. Through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is found in the Worship and Songbook, number 3105, In Christ Alone. And here in the power of Christ, we stand. And knowing that we stand in that power, we know that we are blessed by the spirit that goes with us as we go out into the world with eyes to see the need around us. So go forth this week remembering those blessings of thanksgiving, but also remember the needs of the many, the least of these among us. Reach out, be in love and concern for those who need to know that love and grace of Christ because they see it in you, because you stand in the presence of Christ. Go in peace. Amen.